This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. Uh, I'm here today with Michael Heller, who is a professor of law at Columbia University uh, and also the author uh, most recently of this book, co-author most recently of this book called uh, Mine, um, exclamation point, How the Hidden Rules of Ownership uh, Control Our Lives. Um, and also the author of, of this book, uh, The Gridlock Economy, which came out a while back, which is, I think, still still classic. And uh, you build on some of the themes in, in that book uh, as a property uh, law expert, property law instructor. And, and so, you know, Michael, um, on, on the one hand, when uh, the idea came to you to write, a, you know, an airport book on, mm. on property law, I mean, th this sounds like a kind of a strange idea, right? Because property law is sometimes seen as a very esoteric area. But on the other hand, as you point out, I mean, property is something that everybody believes they understand property is something that's deeply rooted in our psychology. In fact, you know, you, you end the book with, um, the toddler's laws of, of property, <laughs> right? So even as a toddler, you know, you have this idea that, you know, this is mine, uh, and maybe sometimes this is not mine, but more usually it's, you know, this, this, <laughs> this is mine. Um, but, but I think that even though these, these intuitions are, are deeply rooted, I, I think that people overestimate the extent to which they're they're consistent and intuitive. And I think you begin the book by saying that, you know, people seem to think that property is, is intuitive, but when you push them even just a little bit, they realize that um, it's really a jumble of uh, kind of non-coordinated uh, and non-synchronized intuitions. So, so, you know, do you think this is, I mean, what made you think this is something that would really have broad appeal? Well, our goal, uh, my, my co-author is a guy named Jim Salzman, who's an environmental law professor at UCLA. And our goal together uh, was uh, to write a book that was going to be free economics for ownership. We wanted to explain like really basic ideas about ownership, but in ways that were accessible to a lay uh, audience. So that was really our guiding light uh, from the very beginning. So free economics actually takes some pretty sophisticated microeconomic concepts and makes them accessible to an audience that would never you know, willingly sit through even a very fun economics uh, course. So, you know, why do sumo wrestlers cheat and why do drug dealers live with their mothers turn out to be sort of pathways into some really quite complicated ideas about economics. And we had the same thought with this. It's like, you know, people have these intuitions about ownership. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, they think that ownership is for lawyers, which it absolutely is not. It's, it's really something that is very much present in uh, all of our lives uh, every single day. And the question for us was, how do we audition stories that make it sort of fun and easy uh, to see uh, what on how ownership really works? Well, you know, you showed me a picture before the uh, before the podcast about uh, you know your book on the bookshelf in the San Francisco airport, and I imagine that some of those people who pick up the book uh, they they get on the plane and and they may uh, they may see the the knee defender in use, which is how you <laughs> kind of start start the book. Uh, and in you know in that story um, uh, that you tell at the beginning of the book, you you, you say that you ask students, right? Hey, who's, who's in the right here when someone tries to use this, this knee defender and everybody seems to think that they have a, uh, intuitive, um, understanding of, of who's in the right, but, but in fact, um, they don't. Uh, so, so why is it that we, you know, we fail to understand that property is really all about these kind of competing narratives or competing stories or competing analogies? Well, let's, let's start with the example you just gave, which is being on an airplane, you get on a plane, which I haven't done in a while, actually, but you get on a plane and I usually, when I sit down, I pull my laptop out. I'm always trying to get some work done. I'm usually flying somewhere to give a talk. So I pull my laptop out and the person in front of me soon after that leans their seat right into my lap and switches my laptop. So that's actually part of what motivated uh, this book was the question, whose wedge of space is that behind the seat? Is it for the person in front to recline or for the person behind for their knees and for their laptop? And it turns out we have pretty strong intuitions about whose space that is. Um, we can't do this today, but when I, you know, talk, give this talk to a big audience, I always poll them. And it's invariably the case that people are, have extremely strong views. They know what the answer is, who owns that wedge of space. And it's always 50-50. Half the people in the audience think it's the person in front and half think it's the person uh, behind. And what that's happening there is they're both saying mine, and what they don't realize, this goes to your question, is that each of them is pulling on, relying on one of the, what turns out to be just six 
really simple stories that everyone uses to claim everything in the world. So the person in front is saying, the space is mine because it's attached to my seat. That little button controls the wedge and attachment turns out to be um, perhaps the most important ownership principle that most people don't know about. It's why your home is your castle, why the airspace above and the minerals below may or may not be yours. The person behind is relying on just as basic an intuition. They're saying possession. You know, possession is nine-tenths of the law. Uh, and when someone leans into that column of space, they're trespassing. And they're also saying first. I had it first. I had it first for my laptop. First come, first served. So right there with that wedge of space, what you're seeing is three of those six simple stories. Attachment for the person in front, first in possession for the people in back. And those same stories are the same exact stories that kids are using in the playground. And it's also the stories that determine, for example, who owns our click streams, the record of our online likes and looks, which is what drives uh, the internet economy. They all fall back on and rely on those same few simple stories. Well, I imagine that people sometimes flip stories depending on, you know, where they are, right? So when they're on the receiving end of the, the seat that's going back, they may kind of, um, find one story more compelling. And, you know, when they're trying to recline, they, they may find a, a different story, uh, compelling, right? Do you think right, we always, we, yeah, we always have those same few stories at hand. You, know, you, you see it with toddlers in the playground, you see them, you know, grabbing onto some shovel and they're both shouting mine. And what's really going on is, you know, one kid is saying I had it first and the other is saying I'm holding it possession. So they're right there. Those kids are relying on two of those, those same stories. Um, and you know, though they flip depending on who, you know, who, who got there first. Um, so those stories are very much up for grabs. Actually, a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of online ownership today, uh, turns on companies like Amazon and Apple being quite savvy about taking some of those very basic stories and doing exactly that, turning them upside down. So for example, uh, the buy now button on Amazon doesn't mean what people think it means. They think when it says they see a little shopping cart. Uh, they they uh, click buy now. They say, oh, I know what that means. I, I, I bought it. I own it. I own that download. Um, and it turns out that what Amazon and Apple realized is that they could re-engineer ownership so that possession was actually one-tenth of the law, not nine-tenths. So Amazon and Apple actually can and have pulled content, pulled movies and books right off of people's devices. And they have the right to do so because of the way that they've re-engineered ownership down uh, from nine-tenths to one tenth. We still have this very old physical notion of ownership. It's mine because I'm holding it. Uh, but in the online world, it doesn't really work that way at all. And actually, concretely, what that means is that companies like um, Amazon in particular, but also Apple, they earn an extra premium, an extra profit on every download because there's this large and now growing gap between what we feel like we own, our intuitions about ownership, and what we actually own after Apple and Amazon have re-engineered the term, re-engineered possession. Now, I, I doubt that any lawsuits have happened as a result of conflicts over, you know, seat reclining on airplanes, but, you know, these things do ultimately make their way into, into courts. And, you know, even when you look at the, the case that we all start with in, in property law classes and law and economics classes, the famous Pearson, you know, versus, versus post, uh, where these, right. um, interests, you know, come into conflict. Um, you know, courts uh, will will sometimes look to the norms and look to um, kind of, you know, the way in which people intuitively think about things out in, in the field, right? So to what extent do uh, social norms, you know, play an important role here? And to what extent do social norms influence what the the, the courts will ultimately do? Uh, and, and to what extent do the court decisions ultimately kind of influence our, our social norms? To what extent are we carrying around norms that are really just legacies from, uh, you know, court decisions or, or legislation that's happened in the past. Is it, are, are social norms kind of substitutes for, for the law or are they, you know, complements? Very much so. the law? Very, well, they can be both. They can be both substitutes or complements. This is really the sort of billion dollar question of, uh, law. How does law work? And most of our behavior is not uh, mediated through uh, law. We live in a very um, lawyer centered society, but one of the big challenges I always have in teaching my law students, um, is to sort of disabuse them of the notion that law really matters. In my, in my view, uh, law is extremely overrated 
as a mechanism for resolving all of the ownership and allocative conflicts that we sort of go through in our everyday lives. It turns out that, you know, 99.9% .9 of ownership conflicts happen entirely outside of the law, uh, mediated by uh, customs and norms and expectations around these uh, same simple six stories. So for example, if you say you're in a, um, in, a, in a grocery store and you have a shopping cart full of groceries, uh, if someone were to lean over and take out, you know, lean in, say, oh, look, you got some eggs. Those are great. Take the eggs. Lean in again. And, you know, there's some milk. Take the milk out. You would say you would be furious with them. Mm -hmm. It'd be, there'd be a fight. You would say, how is that possible? Those are mine. I, but if you sort of stop for a second and think, it's like, actually, they're not yours. You don't own uh, the groceries in your shopping cart. Um, but uh, people don't lean in and uh, take them out of each other's carts because of the power of this norm or custom of possession. That possession is one of, is, is very deeply rooted. It goes back to our animal and territorial instincts. It's something that kids sort of become masters at it from a very young age. It's a language that we all speak as grownups. And it's a language that basically gets us through, through the day. You know, is this seat taken in the movie theater? These groceries are mine. The seat bat is, you know, all those intuitions that we have about, you know, one daily conflict after another are all rooted in norms and customs around the possession story, not at all in law. Well, you have some great examples of this. Um, you know, I'm from Philadelphia and uh, in South Philly, when there was a snowstorm, right, uh, when you'd shovel out your car, you'd, you'd put a, you know, lawn chair in the spot and everybody understood that that meant that you owned that, that spot. But, you know, you point out that that's maybe the norm in Philadelphia, but that's not going to be the norm in, in, in some other place. Um, and so whether we're talking about norms or, or laws, you know, to what extent are these uh, kind of, you know, arbitrary, uh, conventions and to what extent are they actually performing some, some real, um, some real function, right? Do how, how much, how much faith should we put in the, these agreements, uh, and, and believe as many law and economic scholars do that these things kind of evolve in, in order to allocate resources kind of more efficiently. Well, I love the st st story about the parking chairs. It's actually, you know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm living in New York city. In New York, if you dig out your car after a storm and put a chair in the street, uh, you lose the chair um, and you lose the parking space. Uh, in, in South Philly and Pittsburgh and Chicago and Boston and a few other uh, American cities, uh, you, when you dig that car out, that space is 100% yours. People, everyone recognizes it if they, uh, it's completely outside the law. Um, but the police in those cities won't enforce the law. They enforce the norm. And the norm is sort of a, well, well, they're it, not going um, to tell, they're not going to, they're not going to tow your car if you, if you, if you come in and, and, and but they're not going to defend you if you, they're not going to yeah. defend you if you park in somebody's spot and somebody keys your car or slashes your tires. They're like, you should have known that that was, um, that that was, um, uh, that that was, uh, somebody else's, uh, space. So the police actually defend the norm. They sort of vigilante ownership by, uh, part by, um, by the digger outers and not uh, the person who innocently comes in and uh, takes what looks like apparently an empty spot. Now, those norms, like you say, are allocated mechanisms that exist, that didn't exist some time ago and won't exist at some point in the future. So they didn't exist in Boston or Philadelphia uh, in the 60s and 70s. They actually are fairly, they seem like timeless, um, but they actually are an artifact of, of scarcity in some of these uh, city, um, inner city neighborhoods uh, where um, as more, you know, as more newcomers moved in, the norms began to develop as a way to control those spaces. It used to be people had eyes on the street and they sort of knew um, whose space was in front of whose house and people mostly respected that. In some cities, when the con congestion gets to be too much, uh, those spaces become sufficiently valuable that having spaces sit empty all day, uh, protected by a cone, respecting the possession and labor of the, which are labor is a fourth story. We've had attachment first in possession. Labor, the labor, I mean, you reap what you sow. Is a fourth original story of possession, which drives the notion of parking chairs. Um, uh, at some point, that becomes so inefficient. You know, service people can't park, guests can't park. You have a lot of the neighborhoods. Uh, people are gone for the day at work, and the, and the spaces are empty. So at that point, cities begin to um, impose another layer of control. You do begin to see places like Boston uh, sort of becoming space saver free neighborhoods, as they call it, where those norms are no longer enforced and where. Uh, the city sends sanitation trucks around to go and collect the chairs, treating them as garbage rather than as signals of ownership. So you have, and this is very much true in a lot of sort of economic history, you have different systems of ownership uh, that evolve at different points in response to different technological challenges, population densities, um, uh, and, and, you know, a range of 
uh, a range of factors like that. So I think a lot of, a lot of conventional views of, of property kind of stem from that view that we had as toddlers, which is really built around exclusion, right? So it's, you know, it's either mine or, or, or it's yours. And I, I think one of the things that, that most people who teach property law, uh, have to kind of introduce to their students fairly early on is this whole idea of property as, you know, as a bundle of sticks and as something that can be, um, you know, fragmented almost, uh, you know, infinitely. And, right. and therefore it's, it's really not about exclusion necessarily, but, but it's about, about governance. Right. And does that, does that sort of cause the notion of property to start to bleed into the notion of, of, of contract, right? You know, we, we think of these as sort of different, uh, bodies of law and there's definitely some, some differences, but, but, you know, do you really have to kind of have a good understanding of the logic of contract law in order to really have a comprehensive understanding of property law? Uh, the answer is absolutely that, um, property law and contract law really are, in my view, and this is debated among property theorists and contract theorists, but they are a continuum. Um, at one end, you have the notion of, um, an extreme notion of exclusion. You know, you go, you walk into a parking lot, um, and, uh, one car is yours and everybody else has to stay away from your car. And as to every other car, your sole responsibility is, you know, don't mess with that car, like just exclusion. Um, but that's actually less and less, uh, um, the way that we live our lives. Um, we usually, you know, when we are in a corporate, uh, when we form corporations or partnerships or trusts, even marriages, uh, we actually have a group of people that together, um, own, uh, the resource exclude, they can exclude outsiders, but internally the corporation or partnership or trust or condo, um, has, uh, some shared control over that resource. And in that world governance what the rules are for managing the resource internally become extremely important. It's one of the big questions in economics. Also one of the big questions in law is how do you sort of manage the, what you've called the exclusion and governance divide. I've written a fair bit about that, uh, less so in this book, but it's one of the really basic questions in um, property law. I have a recent book on contract law, which you didn't hold up, um, which is really arguing that contract law is much more property-like mm -hmm. uh, than people realize in the same way that property law is more contract-like, that they bleed together uh, when it's you and me together making a decision, then that's contract. And when it's you against the world, that's property. But most ownership today, for example, in the modern corporation is sort of right squarely in the middle, uh, where there's both elements of, uh, sort of bilateral negotiations and elements of sort of, uh, multilateral exclusion. Yeah. When we think about law, I mean, a lot of times people don't think of law as a, as a technology, right? But, but, you know, that perspective, thinking of law as a, as a technology, as a tool for, you know, the accomplishment of certain ends and, and something which can be, um, kind of developed over time, you know, you can make it kind of more sophisticated and, you know, new tools can be invented to solve kind of, you know, new problems. Uh, you know, one of the examples that, that I always talk about in, in my classes is this idea of unitization, right? And you, you talk right. a little bit I about it, right? Yeah. And yeah. it's, it's, it's really, it's really kind of like a, a technology, um, that, you know, solves a problem. Um, but it, you know, the tech, not the evolution of legal technology, it's a little bit different from the evolution of what we normally think of as, as technology, because it, it's not like it's, it's, it's completely new. I mean, it's kind of borrowing concepts that, kind of already exist in, in other places, you know, redescribing things. It's, it's almost more kind of literary than, than technological in that sense. Is, is, no, I love is there, that example. Yeah. Are there new, are there really like completely new things? Like when we think about, for instance, um, you know, you know, tradable emission permits, right? I mean, right. this is a new technology, but it's kind of conceptually built on, on things that we, we all are familiar with. Yeah. So I, if, if there's one, uh, Takeaway for your listeners today. Um, I, um, I, I, I think this may be the, the right one for today. We may, we may have a second, but this is one I really want to sort of reinforce for your listeners, which is this notion that we're sort of very familiar with, I know that rocket technology puts people on the moon and people mostly miss how ownership functions as a technology in exactly the same way. Um, and it has the same sort of constraints for its production. Um, it evolves in the same way technology evolves, it solves problems in the same way. People think of ownership as a sort of monolithic, uh, category. Uh, but, um, for the example you gave of unitization, unitization is a technology, uh, for solving tragedies of the commons, uh, in, uh, originally in oil extraction, uh, in states like, uh, Pennsylvania, states where sort of oil drilling, uh, first started in America. 
So most states now in America that have substantial oil industries, uh, leaving aside Texas, surprisingly, uh, um, have unitization where they basically create a, essentially a condominium association for um, of the surface landowners, uh, where they each have their separate um, surface uh, uses, cattle or um, cattle or uh, um, farming, ranch uh, uh, farming, um, but they operate as a single unit for purposes of oil extraction. So a single manager uh, is, uh, you know, tasked with having the optimal number of uh, wells and the optimal uh, drilling extraction rate. And that turns out to be an extraordinarily more effective way to manage an oil field uh, than the old uh, uh, race to capture, uh, which destroyed a lot of oil fields uh, a century ago. Uh, but it took um, the introduction of that technology to solve that the problem wasn't the drilling technology, the problem was the ownership technology. And we have many, many examples of that. So condominiums, for example, are another example. Until quite recently, when you wanted to build up, you built apartments in America. There was a handful of cities like New York City that had this somewhat cumbersome, awkward cooperative structure that still exists, uh, sort of an artifact of 100 years ago. But we had no mechanism for individually owning a unit in a larger building. And once that was invented, once that technology was created, it was actually adapted from a German model, uh, went into Puerto Rican law, and from there came into the U.S. law in around 1960. Uh, once that was brought into the U.S., an entirely new ver type of building was possible. Um, the, the limits on, on construction weren't, again, weren't cement and rebar. They were the absence of, and then later creation of, this new technology called uh, the condominium. So we see versions of this appearing absolutely all the time in the intellectual property area. We see it in the, it's, it's really been at the forefront of environmental innovation. Like this is an area where ownership has actually does matter and has been enormously powerful and effective and successful is to come up with uh, new forms of ownership uh, that solve collective action problems the same way that unitization does for the race to capture, um, basically sort of limiting a, a bad um, and condominiums do for basically introducing the public good, which is the ability to pay for elevators and roofs and golf courses and all the other kinds of things that condo associations uh, can pay for. So tradable emissions permits and a whole variety of versions of those Many, they all have, you know, kind of unpronounceable acronyms, um, uh, but they all have been, that's the forefront. Those ownership tools are really the forefront of, and then been the best chance that we have uh, for solving um, a lot of climate change debates. And actually, just to circle back to our, to the start of our talk today, if you're thinking about that airplane seat and attachment, um, all of the most powerful tools for solving climate change are this, does have the same structure um, as that recline, recline button on your airplane seat. They're all about attachment. So all those forest dwellers in the Amazon, uh, they, um, they live among these trees, but they don't get any of the benefits of carbon sequestration uh, from those trees. So what um, those tradable emissions permits or in the, in the, in the, um, in the forest context, um, basically carbon offset programs do, is they treat those forest dwellers as if they own, they treat them as if those trees were attached as if the services that those trees provided are attached to their land. So they're not, they're not in law, but what those, um, what those carbon offset programs do is say, we are going to treat you forest dwellers. You may not even own that land, but we're going to pay you as if you owned those services that were attached to those trees in your land. So attachment redesign turns out to be the core for all of our most successful climate change, also fishery protection um, designs. So, you know, I teach primarily strategy. And so in, in, in strategy, uh, one of the main themes that I talk about is like, hey, if you're trying to, you know, generate rents and, and you know, protect those rents, you, you have a couple tools in your toolbox. And, you know, one of them is, is, is technology, right? So if you can build, I don't know, digital rights management, right? That's a, that's right. a sort of a technological way of, of protecting your rents and, and creating exclusion and so forth. Or you can rely on the law, right? So if you can, you know, sue people for uh, copying your 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 product right. or, or whatever, uh, and and really, like any good business person, you're just going to compare the marginal benefit to the marginal cost of, of pursuing those different um, avenues. And then there's people out yeah. there, you know, generating technologies that help people protect both in the legal and the non-legal domains. But you know, do you think that the innovation in the legal domain is is kind of able to happen as as quickly as as you see innovation in, in sort of the the ever increasingly rapid technological world 
Um, or do we need to have kind of an acceleration in the innovation in the legal space to kind of keep up with the, the evolution? You know, you, you mentioned the kind of longstanding debate between kind of Blackstone and Holmes, right? Where, right. you know, Blackstone's really about, hey, you know, people do make reliance investments. They, they expect things to be a certain way. You know, if I'm, you know, if I build, uh, you know, if, if I, if I thought that I could plant trees and then you'd come along and tell me, oh yeah, you can't plant trees that that's going to deter investment versus the Holmes idea, which is, Hey, you know, that old arrangement was, you know, is keeping, um, you know, wealth constrained. We need to kind of sweep it away and, and, and change it. Um, do we kind of get that balance right? Do we need to kind of rethink that balance when, when things are changing more quickly? Well, I would have sort of two pieces of response to that. One goes back to something we were talking about a little bit before, which is the shopping cart image that we had. Uh, I th so I think um, most of the mechanisms that we use for the kind of resource allocation conflicts that you're talking about um, happen outside of law altogether. Uh, so you talked about digital rights management as one solution which is a tech, a sort of a straight technology solution. But we have many other ways of basically solving resource conflicts besides that and besides law. So first mover advantage. You know, Bloomberg built a multi-billion dollar industry, not on ownership and not on DRM. He built it on being a millisecond faster. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of, um, uh, in the fashion world, we have no property, right, very few property rights, no, no copyright in particular for fashion design, but we still have extremely innovative um, fashion world um, and what's become a really powerful tool for resource conflict management there is social media. So shaming is a very powerful tool um, historically for allocating property rights, uh, you know, making fun of people, negative truthful gossip as Bob Ellickson has written about. Um, but that's also true even in the mo sort of most modern uh, sort of uh, anonymous markets. Uh, you still have um, uh, Twitter uh, bombing on urban outfitters to get them to pull some design that's copying uh, some uh, new young designer who's getting squashed by them. So we have a bunch of, I mean, secrecy is another mechanism. So for example, um, Tesla uh, and SpaceX, Elon Musk has um, uh, been very forward about saying, we don't really rely on the patent system. It's a very innovative company, but they don't rely on law as the way to sort of uh, propel technology. So for, uh, for Tesla, he's basically made uh, all of his patents available to his competitors. His position is, we, the comp electric car industry, are competing against gas, and I want there to be uh, a bunch of more effective electric cars out there. So he's made his patents available to them there. And in the SpaceX context, he's basically used secrecy, he simply, um, which is another mechanism yeah. for protecting uh, for ownership, is not, uh, not, having patents, uh, not having patents at all. So uh, secrecy, first mover advantage, um, uh, gossip, uh, social media. We have many, many tools that are all outside of the law that turn out to solve an enormous amount more resource conflicts, uh, sort of ownership conflicts than people realize. As lawyers, especially economists, sometimes uh, sort of have a mystification in, of an over uh, sort of con connection with law that I think is not actually borne out when you look at how the modern economy um, actually operates. That's one piece of the answer is, is basically law is less, not, not is kind of overrated. Second piece is sort of the production of legal technology. Um, so in certain areas, there's enough private gains to production of new legal tools that you do see them emerge. So for example, uh, you do see uh, new forms of um, uh, very sophisticated debt instruments get created uh, that sort of function like property uh, in the financial world. There's enough money being to be made by being you know, the first big bank that offers it and then people follow in later. So you do see some production, uh, particularly in the commercial area of new forms of law privately generated. Uh, you see that less in spheres like the sphere of intimacy, uh, like where, you know, we have marriage and we have living together, but we don't have as many sort of forms of uh, property ownership around marriage like we do around the corporation because there's, you know, fewer private gains uh, to them and, and governments, your alternative producer is going to be the government, which is, you know, has uh, more or less interest in creating these new forms and more or less capacity to do so in a smart way. So you do see um, a lot of borrowing from country to country, like with a condominium, but, um, but less public creation. Yeah, no, I, I think the idea that you're gonna kind of redirect your investments in the area where you can actually, you know, protect your investments. So in the area, you know, where you talk a lot about data. I mean, I think, you know, companies have, more or less open source their analytics. They used to think they could have some kind of advantage by having superior analytics. And now they realize, oh, let's just open source that, but we're going to jealously guard, right, our data because that, that's the sure. source of, of our, of our advantage.
but but still, to the extent that you know things changed, doesn't doesn't that alter the math? I mean, you use the example of first mover, right? So, right. Um, you know, in, in my class, I use the example of of, of fashion, uh, and I say, well, you know, twenty years ago, thirty years ago, you could be first to market with some new design, and and you could probably kind of milk that until you know the next season, and then that's when the imitators would show up. But with right. fast fashion, you know, you might have you know, 15 minutes before, you know, the factories in, in, uh, in Shenzhen start cranking out a copy of whatever it is that you have on the runway during fashion week. And so, right. so, you know, you, 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 you know, the demand presumably for copyright protection is, is going to be stronger when, when those barriers go down. Yes, of course you can, you know, rely more on trademark and other things, but, but still th there, there has to be a change in, in, in the calculus. I mean, the other example I use is, you know, Intel where, you know, they really just, couldn't make any money from, from DRAM after, you know, Toshiba and those guys got really, you know, much, much quicker at, at copying because of the patent pool. So they yeah. just kind of said, all right, well, we're just going to stop investing in that space and we're going to invest in, in microprocessors because we, there's no patent pool. Right. So, right. so does, do those, you know, create kind of pent up demand for, you know, a change in the law where maybe now we might say, Hey, you know, copyright in fashion might not seem like such a dumb idea or a copyright in, you know, recipes or jokes, you know, might not seem like such a bad idea given the, 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 the much, much lower cost of imitation that, that exists. Well, um, a, a couple answers. Uh, the first is a shout out here for Carl Rastiella and Chris Brigman, who wrote a very, uh, sort of insightful book in exactly this space called the knockoff economy. I don't know if you've had them on your show, but this was, it was a really, uh, the book is going to be 10 years old now, but it, but it, what it does is it shows, uh, the ex sort of surprising hidden economic benefits of non-ownership in places, yeah. in spaces like fashion, uh, jokes, uh, recipes, uh, uh, coaches, sports plays, and so on. So they, they really sort of crystallize this notion of the sort of, of the alternative mechanisms for, uh, uh, in, uh, in incentivizing, uh, innovators, uh, even without ownership. So there's, from, from reading their work, uh, it doesn't seem to me like uh, fashion or jokes or uh, comedians or sports have ground to a halt, uh, even in the absence of protections. Um, and from a, from a consumer welfare standpoint, uh, you want, you know, information to be free. You don't, the, the downside, if it's free, is that, you know, producers have less in, uh, creation, less incentive to create. So the goal is, the, from my point of view, is always what is the absolute minimum we can give to get some level of innovation that we're looking for. And it turns out that the answer is much less legal protection than lawyers in particular and innovators lobby for. So innovators, the fashion industry, uh, for example, or the, the Apples, the Amazons, uh, the music industry, they're always lobbying for more property rights. Um, but I think that's mostly social, social welfare reducing, not increasing. Uh, and I think we have much too much copyright in this country and much too much patent in this country. I think we actually, a lot of the patents, I think this is a work by Besson and Moyer at BU. They wrote a couple of years ago, they, there's, there's a finding, it may, may or may not be, it's hard to actually pin down, but what they said was, I think they're, they're right intuitively, is that overall the U.S. patent system is actually um, social welfare destroying, uh, reducing it. Actually, uh, we'd be better off without a patent system with, with no patent protections, with the, uh, with the sole exception of pharmaceuticals. Uh, that there's such a high ramp up there innovation and it's so easy to copy the pill in the bottle so so there you need some kind of protection but but for that but for that the entire rest of the patent system uh, could be done away with and we would actually be uh, better off now pat and you know patent owners would be would be upset uh but uh but from a from a social welfare standpoint we'd be better off the same same with copyright a lot we have way 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 too much copyright protection in this country uh and much too little ability to sort of build on and develop from, um, uh, you know, existing works. Well, perhaps the producers of those intellectual property, don't, they fail to appreciate the extent to which they're, you know, uh, using other people's intellectual property, right? Sure. Like, uh, and, public, and they all are, enemy. you know, they, it's only a very small number of stories and we all tell the same stories over and over. Um, and uh, same with language, right? Language, we all build on each other's uh, use of it. Um, uh, so yeah, so producers always want more, but I, I think we should resist the siren call of more property rights. Well, you talk a lot about the, kind of the bright line rules versus standards and, and, you know, is, is there, is, is this really a case for more, more standards and less bright line rules? I mean, if you think about patents, right. I mean, we have one patent life, right. And, and, you know, maybe it, you know, pharma has, 
a, a different um, optimum patent life than you know some other kind of product or process. I mean, should should we just think about doing things in a more more granular way? Um, or I mean, I'm not saying it should be a, a you know a balancing test where every single yeah. specific case is going to be determined on the merits by a judge, right? But but you know. Could could there be sort of more granularity in these protections and and there there uh, could be then I think the issue here turns out to be less an economics issue than a political economics issue. So for example, for the copyright system, you do have much more of that granularity. So different uh, uh, industries get to Congress and get their uh, the, there's a separate section of the Copyright Act on boat hull protection <laughs> that was written by the you know boat manufacturers. Um, so th they have much more tailored protection in copyright. Um, which has meant that there's a lot more rent seeking around copyright yeah. uh, reform um, and a lot more end up protection for incumbent industry. The thing about the patent system with its, I think, crazy wealth destroying 20 year term for everybody is that you end up pitting um, a lot of powerful industries against each other. So farmers always pushing for more, uh, but uh, big tech now is always pushing for less. Um, so they actually push each other to a stalemate, at least on domestic patent law reform. Uh, and that turns out to be a good thing. Uh, I think at least a better, I mean, the, the, the first best would be, uh, much less patent law, uh, but the second best is stasis rather than the worst, which is what we have in copyright where each industry basically gets its own, uh, sort of carve out of anti-competitive space that they can get Congress to offer them. Now you also mentioned kind of numerous clauses and, and this is the idea that, you know, we can only have a fixed kind of number of configurations or, uh, types of, of property. I mean. Look, we we've come a long way since since Blackstone, right? So you know, what do should do we kind of rely too much on this? I mean, should you you offer this um, idea of a marriage menu, right? Um, sure. uh, towards towards the end of the book, right? I mean, isn't that sort of a metaphor for a whole bunch of other things that we could potentially offer menus for? Uh, I mean, we've seen the proliferation of corporate forms, right? It used to be partnership and right. corporation. Now we have got you know LLCs and LPs and you know, um, and more or less, you know, check the box variety where you can, you know, mix and match whatever you want to create right. whatever kind of organization you want. Um, should, should we maybe think about facilitating a, a broader palette of, um, of property rights? All right. Sure. So, um, again, this comes back to, I guess, what, what has turned into our theme for the day, which is property as a technology. So the numerous clauses is an old Latin term. Uh, which means that the number of forms is fixed. So you can own, you can rent, uh, you can have a license, uh, you know, you have copyright, you have patent, but you don't have an unlimited number of forms of ownership, uh, the same way that you have an unlimited number of forms of contract. We can contract for almost whatever we want, but it's historically been a fairly limited number of forms of ownership. And there's been a lot of scholarship about why that might be the case. Why is it that there's less, why is it that there are fewer forms of ownership? I've weighed in on that, a bunch of other. Um, uh, Henry Smith at Harvard has weighed in, um, uh, Hanok Dagan in Tel Aviv has weighed in, a bunch of people. And no one really knows, like, what's the answer? But whatever the answer is or was, uh, what you do see today is that it's a lot cheaper um, to manage the technology of ownership in ways that wasn't possible before. It used to be you had to stand in a field and hand over a clot of dirt uh, because you didn't really have technology uh, for who owned what. And that sort of physical public ceremony uh, is what um, ensured that people were all on the same page about whose field was whose. And now you are basically, you know, on your cell phone, you can control all of that. So now it becomes possible uh, to use your cell phone to have kinds of micro payments and micro ownership, um, which is a lot of what drives uh, um, much of the internet economy, much of the so-called sharing economy. It's not really about sharing, um, but that notion uh, is uh, sort of being able to uh, have a new technology of ownership uh, that's gone online um, and allows us to have a lot more freedom uh, to create uh, forms of ownership that are responsive to, uh, mostly to collect, but, well, but property largely does is solve collective action problems that are otherwise uh, lead to various kinds of um, tragedy, like unitization uh, uh, solving race to capture for uh, oil or condominium solving the ability to basically get, get um, collective public goods um, around where we live. So many of those forms now become possible. You, you see, for example, uh, again, I'm in New York City around Times Square, you have um, uh, business improvement districts uh, where the neighboring uh, sh uh, shops uh, provide security and better trash cans and benches and some trees. Well, all that better public space um, going above the norm uh, 
is exists because of something called the business improvement district, a bid, which is another new form of ownership that was only, it was actually, that one actually came from Canada in the seventies and was exported from Canada to the U S in the eighties and has now become fairly ubiquitous across the country. So we have, uh, you know, various kinds of solutions that get imported or developed, um, uh, uh, as the, as the, we are more able to sustain them technologically. Right now, I think, you know, a lot of attention has been given over the years to this idea of you know, tragedy, of the commons, right. And part of, you know, this goes back to, I mean, Adam Smith was writing about this, uh, the idea that, you know, if you create private property, it's going to overcome all sorts of, um, you know, misaligned incentives, it's going to create more wealth and so forth. And I think, you know, where, where you, you first kind of came onto the, to the scene, the first time I, I remember when, meeting you and reading about your work, it was this idea of the, the anti-commons, right? Which is really, yep. you, you describe it as having like, you know, too much property. I mean, it's, it's, it's not quite too much or too little. It's really, you know, you have, um, you know, uh, property that is, is, is insufficiently, uh, divvied up versus property that is too far divvied up. And in both cases, uh, transaction costs get in the way of kind of optimal resource allocation. Could, could you, could you talk a bit more about that kind of, you know, historically, if you, if suppose there was some kind of meter, it's, you know, tracked the extent to which, you know, commons versus anti-commons were, were a problem. You know, w would you say that, that the, the anti-commons problem is, is sort of, you know, much more severe now than, than it has been in, in the past because of greater rights fragmentation, or is it kind of a, a equal race where, you know, th there's a tragedy of the commons, obviously in, in the envi in environment and global warming, which is kind of giving right. the anti-commons a run for its money. Sure. Um, so commons and anti-commons are sort of mathematical inversions of each other. Tragedy of the commons, you know, we all waste a resource. We, you know, we pollute the air because they, we can all put pollution in the costs are born collectively. Any commons is the notion that if you have too many owners, the resource is wasted. It's just as wasted, but wasted by being um, underused. So I think that the um, underuse uh, uh, tragedy uh, is a somewhat of a more modern um, uh, problem uh, because it requires lots of property rights. So mm -hmm. I think the proliferation of patents is a good example. Um, and uh, in, in the last, in the first book, you, sh you showed up the good luck economy. I wrote about that in some detail. In this book, mine, I, I talk about other um, examples of um, sort of too much ownership of, of patent rights. So, for example, just recently with um, COVID, um, this is actually in, in the mine book. Um, uh, the most recent example is the CRISPR technology, the, the technology that basically we use for gene editing. That's actually owned by quite a number of different um, parties. They were able to license it together to get COVID vaccines out pretty quickly. But each of the people who own a piece of COVID uh, um, potentially. Uh, can be a toll booth or a veto to some collective use of that technology towards some other ultimate goal, which is not the gene editing, it's the pill in the bottle or the vaccine in the arm. So that's uh, sort of generally true of tragedy of the commons. If you have too many owners, uh, they, the negotiations can break down and that new, the ultimately valuable resource, the vaccine or the pill, uh, never gets developed. And we see that a lot also with copyrights, where you see a lot of uh, uh, films, documentaries uh, that uh, can't get re-released because the original rights that were clear 20 years ago uh, aren't available anymore and the, these old shows basically uh, stay uh, in the vault. So uh, the tragedy of any commons turns out to be an artifact of having the technology where it, that makes it very easy to create sort of small fragments of ownership, uh, but not the technology to assemble them back together. So condos, um, uh, unitization, uh, business improvement districts, those are all technologies for assembling property rights back together to achieve some collective social good. Uh, we don't have that so easily uh, in the intellectual property area. So we actually, it's part of why you see a lot of sort of lost innovation uh, in this country it has to do with uh, the lack of those tools like unitization in the IP area. Mm -hmm. Well, so you have a whole chapter on kind of um, rights and body parts and, and, you know, that, that sort of thing. And um, you know, th this is, this is always an area that I find interesting because there's, there's so much more going on than, you know, property rights. I mean, there's, there's, it, it impacts so much of, um, how we think of ourselves as people and, you know, what we think of as, as sacred. Uh, and, you know, sometimes we think the ability to own something is, um, is, is sacred, but also the, um, fact that you might be able to own something is, is a violation of our view of, of the sacred. Right. And, and I think you try to navigate this by, um, saying, 
if we if we move away from kind of this on off switch view of of ownership and and property and we start thinking more about dials and and right. you know digging into this idea of the bundle of sticks then we can we can sometimes overcome some of these um anxieties that we have we might be able to balance these different competing views of of, of ownership um is this just an, another example of of being innovative with respect to uh designing technologies or or is there also this this idea that you know the technology uh of ownership isn't going to kind of find roots unless it uh also comes with a corresponding set of stories that that help people to make you know to to find meaning in the way these these allocation schemes operate. Right. So we've talked about some of those stories. We, we talked about possession as a story that Apple and Amazon are very skilled at maneuvering. Uh, first is one we haven't talked about in detail, attachment um, with as um, the sort of solution for climate change. So now we're moving into another one of those basic stories, which is my body and myself. It's mine because it comes from my body. And uh, this is a really fraught area for ownership because it traces back in this country uh, so directly to slavery, to the um, ownership of African American uh, bodies, and then the sort of end of that um, of that uh, that uh, horror. Um, and the question now is: uh, now that we have new medical technologies that make the ownership of pieces of our bodies possible, uh, do we say no? Uh, you shouldn't be able, for example, to sell your kidney um, or your eggs or your uh, to rent out your womb if you're a woman to gestate somebody else's child. Do we say no to that because it's too much like um, slavery, uh, or do we, uh, which is a sort of the, um, you know, one version of the on off switch, or do we say, yes, you know, this is just a market item, like any other item you might have protections for it. The same way we have protections. If you buy a gun or a car, we have certain, um, restrictions and we have certain restrictions possibly to protect people from being exploited around selling their kidneys. Uh, but you know, we can just treat them as market, uh, resources. That'd be the other version. And what I, and what we write about in the book, and this is actually, I think one of the real uh, contributions of this book about mine is like we have, I think, a, a fresh way of thinking about uh, ownership of the body. That was this notion of the dimmer that lets us sort of um, turn uh, different um, uh, aspects of ownership to be directly responsive to the moral, the very deep competing moral concerns that people bring to uh, this area of law. Now, I think these concerns are just as deep uh, in the airplane seats and click streams for your online data and who owns your genetic data. Uh, you know, all ownership conflicts have in them these very deep uh, moral uh, uh, conflicts over autonomy uh, versus coercion uh, versus efficiency. Those would be the three variables. Um, but they're particularly visible uh, in areas like gestational surrogacy, when a woman carries somebody else's baby uh, to term. And I think that we can actually get some traction in thinking about those problems uh, by uh, thinking about this dimmer uh, argument. Right. And, um, and you, uh, introduced this other concept, which actually it's, it, when I, when I read it, I, I was thinking well, that, that seems like such a no brainer concept that I, I wondered why I'd never heard it before. And this is the idea of kind of the, the sticky staircase, right. As a, as a, <laughs> as a counter to the, uh, the slippery slope, right. Because the slippery slope argument pops up in, in so many legal contexts, uh, particularly in, in property, right? So, yep. you know, even in the, in the domain that you were just referring to, right? If, if I can, if I can sell my kidney, then the next thing I'll, and I'll be doing is I'll be, you know, selling myself into, into slavery. So, so, you know, you suggest this idea of the, the, the stickery, sticky staircase as a, as a counter to the, to the slippery, slippery slope. So, um, talk, maybe just talk about that just as a general rhetorical form and, and, you know, where it can be used and, and why it's so necessary. Well, throughout the book, one of the things that we try to do is basically give away all of our secrets about ownership. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so sticky staircase is, is, is one of them. So people, um, always talk about slippery slopes and it's, it's basically a kind of a, a, a trumping kind of argument. Like, you know, we can't do, we shouldn't do this smart thing because if we do this, this terrible thing will happen. It's, you know, it's something that parents use with their kids. No, you can't stay up late tonight. You can't have the ice cream because your teeth will fall out or you'll, you know, this terrible thing will happen mm -hmm. if we do this one reasonable thing. And the secret response, the tool that you need to use as an ownership designer or someone fighting about ownership is to come back with a sticky staircase. No, let's just do, we'll just do this. It's, it's not a slippery slope. We won't just roll to the bottom. We'll just go down one step and we'll stick there. So let's just do this one reasonable thing. And then if there's some other reasonable thing that we can do, we can do that, or we can just uh, stay here. 
So I think Sticky Staircase is a really powerful rhetorical tool about not just ownership, but also parenting um, that sort of makes visible that ownership is very much a choice. And it's a choice among this very small handful of stories, possession, self-ownership, first in time, labor, uh, and so on. Uh, but, uh, but once you're in the, in, in one of those stories, uh, you can, uh, make choices and, um, people think this is again, another problem that for non lawyers and lawyers alike is that people feel that ownership and possession, um, is really fixed. Like these are rules are just set and you just have to operate by them, but these rules are up for grabs way more than people realize. And the sticky staircase is a useful tool, useful rhetorical tool when you're told you can't do something. Uh, because it'll cause the end of the world. No, let's just do this one reasonable thing. Uh, a, a colleague at uh, UCLA, Eugene Volick, actually has an article on the sticky staircase uh, a couple of years ago. That's where I got the idea from. Yeah. So, you know, when you at, when you wrap up the book, I mean, you talk about kind of the changing business models, and, and this is stuff that I spend a lot of time on, and you talk about kind of the sharing economy. It's it probably, that's, that's a horrible term for it, right? Sharing economy, because it's not about sharing. It's about really... Um, converting products into services, right? And right. to, you know, which ultimately you, you point out is going to, you know, result in in much more concentrated ownership, right? Because it's right. not, it's not like, you know, peer to peer sharing of my car. It's about having a, a company that kind of owns all the cars and then you kind of access them, right? Uh, whenever, whenever you right. need them. And, um, and this business model, of course, uh, you know, relies in part on, 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 the law, but it also kind of relies on this, this technology, right? So if we think about, um, you know, uh, office 365, I mean, office 365 right. is, is a, is essentially converting property into contract, right? They're not, I mean, roughly, right. I mean, it, right. there's elements of both in both the sale of a DVD, uh, you know, where you, you're, you're essentially licensing the software, but you know, you, to some extent you really have this thing to, right. You know, if you fail to make your monthly payment, then boom, you know, you, you get, you get cut off and, and there's, there's, you know, new technology that will allow the bank to shut off your car. If you fail to make a, a payment on, on your, on your car. And, um, you know, some people think of that as kind of like a, a, a form of smart contract, a loosely defined. Um, right. so will will these new, both legal and, um, uh, you know, scientific technologies completely reconfigure the, the, the landscape of, of ownership. Um, is, is this something that, um, you know, we're prepared for both as, as lawyers and, and as, as, uh, as users of these services? Well, I, I'm not a techno utopian in that sense. Um, uh, so here's, here's what's happening is as we do move, um, our lives online, um, if a lot of the scholarship around this says, oh, this is completely new, we have a completely new world of ownership that we're going into. That isn't my view at all. You still have the same basic six stories what you, what the, um, um, of ownership. What we don't have, however, is sort of our capacity yet to really understand how those stories translate. So the, so the reason that Amazon gets this extra premium is that they, are, they do have a good sense about how online ownership works, and we don't. So there was a study out of the University of Pennsylvania a few years ago showing that about 85% of people uh, believe that they own when they buy something, download something online, mm -hmm. they own it in exactly the same way that they own it when they own the physical thing. And that is just not, not right. So it's that gap between what we feel we own and what we actually own that actually creates a whole world of uh, sort of arbitrage and profit for um, online uh, retailers. So what, as we, what we're doing is we're moving essentially from a world of stock to a world of flow, a world where we, you know, we have the book in our shelf to a world where we stream it and then it's, and then it's gone. But you, you know, if you don't make the payments on, on your iPhone either, you lose access to your music, you lose access to your photos. Um, so, uh, for me, I actually kind of like, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm a bit old fashioned here, but I, I feel like we lose a uh, part of ourselves when we move, uh, more and more of our lives online. So I still have cookbooks from 20, 30 years ago. I still have Physical books, yeah, physical, physical books. I still buy yeah. books and, and, and those cookbooks have stains on them from dinner parties from a long time ago, which are very meaningful to me. They, you know, some of them are cookbooks from my parents and it sort of evokes that connection. So, um, that, I think that physical connection to stuff is actually an important part of who we are. And it's something we're at some risk of losing as we move to, um, our online lives. You know, I actually kind of have a very powerful memory of my first car and what it meant to me. You don't have the same feeling when it's, you know, just, you know, 
Uber or a car. Um, I have a very strong sense of, you know, uh, around these cookbooks, which you don't get when you just, you know, click Uber Eats or Grubhub. So, you know, moving to a world that's online, I think, look, we lose something. I think we lose something if we, for example, sort of are leasing our dogs or, you know, renting or streaming our, our wedding rings, right? Rather than having them be in some sense ours. Uh, so the new brave new world of uh, flow of services, I think has some sort of uh, spiritual uh, loss to us potentially. Yeah. But uh, the other, I guess the other concern is that, um, you know, because it's really a world of contract um, and those contracts can, you know, there's a lot of flexibility. I mean, we have default rules, but which nobody even knows what they are. And then right. everyone can contract around those default rules. So if, if our expectations are still rooted in, in, in a world that's very different um, and we wind up entering into these contracts that, you know, we really don't understand that are completely different and have um, consequences that are different from our intuitive sense that's evolved over, you know, decades of kind of pre-existing organizational forms, then, you know, people may be making suboptimal decisions, right? I mean, do you think that we can either um, improve on this by having more mandatory rules or, you know, ha a lot of people just say, oh, it's just about communication and transparency and make sure that everybody knows exactly what they're getting into. But there's probably limitations uh, to kind of how many different forms of contract you could enter into, right? Um, should we kind of go back to a, numerous clauses where there's like, okay, here are the, the you know, three basic ways that you can uh, obtain services from, from one of these companies? Well, in some areas, I think we have too few form, too few forms of ownership. I think that we're starting to see more forms of uh, intimacy that uh, aren't really very well reflected in the sort of on-off switch: you're single or you're married. This, uh, no, forms of cohabitation or other forms of um, sort of family structures that could be supported in law and could be very important for family formation that we don't have. And we see on the other hand this proliferation in the in the um, uh, commercial world uh, that are kind of hard for people to make sense of. Um, so, uh, we, I think I would be somewhat more, um, prescriptive, uh, for areas where we're the sort of predictable, uh, failures of understanding, uh, like with, uh, um, with the online shopping cart that, that isn't really conveying to people uh, what they think it means. Um, and we probably should have some, uh, some more, uh, regulation around, uh, those, uh, sort of very, uh, demonstrable, uh, failures, um, uh, uh, and sort of consumer rationality. And, you know, when legal change happens, it changes, uh, it, it, it sort of originates in a couple different places. I mean, it happens sure. in the courts. It also happens in the, in the legislature. Um, and you, you introduce a couple situations where, you know, the courts will kind of be very reluctant to kind of change things going forward. And they'll kind of wait for the legislature to, um, to make these changes. Do, do where, I mean, where do you think the biggest frictions are when it comes to kind of, you know, having the law change to accommodate these, um, perhaps newer, uh, or, you know, restore older forms of, of, of legal, um, legal rules. I mean, is it, is it, is, are the courts, um, do the courts need to have a bigger role or are the courts kind of, uh, 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 holding us back or is the legislator holding it back, holding us back? Let me, let me sort of answer by way of a concrete example. So this is something called the right of publicity back in the 1950s. Uh, but there was two big baseball card companies, Bowman and Topps, uh, and Bowman had basically locked up all the baseball players with exclusive contracts. And, uh, Topps said, no, listen, you, you know, there's no right to people's uh, image. We can just print their image on our cards. And they uh, went to court and eventually, uh, New York court actually said, created what's now known as the right of publicity, the right to your own persona, to commercialize your persona. It's now a huge industry. It's a lot of, uh, it's now how uh, a lot of athletes make their money is through, uh, through, through, through those kinds of endorsements. So that property right was created at the state level by a state court. Um, later it didn't, the details of it didn't make a lot of sense and state legislatures in many states got in and fixed pieces, adjusted it, uh, to make us a, a, a legislative version of the right of publicity. Um, in Georgia, um, there's no legislative act, uh, but the Martin Luther King Jr. estate is based there and they've been, they're extremely litigious. Um, and they've pushed the boundaries on many different areas of both copyright law and in this case, right of publicity. So they got the Georgia courts, eventually the Georgia Supreme Court to create a right of publicity in Georgia. 
that protects uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's. This was to stop having some little plastic busts uh, from being uh, made without paying the estate. Uh, but when the court there created that right, they didn't put any limit on it. So it lasts forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, if a legislature creates that court and in the states where it's been created, it has their, their time-limited rights because all intellectual property rights uh, should be time-limited because you want people to be able to innovate uh, around them. And that's part of why we have fair use and copyright. You want people to be able to use them to build, uh, to build uh, new things. So when you have the courts uh, create the property right, like Georgia with the right of publicity, um, they often do it in a dumb way. And the right, the court there did it in a dumb way. Um, but you don't have legislature necessarily coming back to fix it because, if you, you know, who's going to lobby uh, in the public interest to have a more uh, uh, sort of uh, finely tailored social welfare maximizing rather than privately maximizing for the King, King estate uh, property right. So um, the way I think about sort of relationship between courts um, and legislatures and businesses that sometimes can create these new rights as well, um, is as a sort of a study of comparative, uh, institutional incompetence. So we want to assign, uh, the rights creation who creates ownership rules to the least incompetent of our bodies. Um, and they turn out to be all be pretty incompetent for different reasons, right? Courts are limited to specific cases and they're very bad at making general policy uh, legislatures can be easily captured by, uh, by lobbyists, you know, Disney corporation is famous for going to Congress um, and throwing a lot of money around and basically buying copyright term extension ad, copyright term extensions there for to protect Mickey Mouse, not in the public interest, but in Disney's interest. So is Congress good at making property rights? No. Are the courts good? No. But what we're looking for is, you know, who's least bad in any particular context to address some particular problem that we're, that we're facing as for resource uh, allocation. Yeah. And the example I think about is kind of, um, non-competes, right? So California famously, uh, bans non-competes. Um, but you know, the other 47 states that allow them, they, they, the courts have not been the ones to kind of knock them down. It's really been legislatures that have been held responsible. Their, their job is to do this and they they don't seem to be doing it. Um, uh, and so, um, I, I love this idea of relative incompetence. The only problem is, you know, who gets to decide? Who gets to decide? And unfortunately, it's not always well, law professors. And well, I wouldn't trust law professors. You know, it's, it's um, uh, it, because all these problems uh, um, of non-competes, um, of great publicity, is at the end, they're all, they all have an empirical component to them. Um, and we have really bad data. And law professors in particular are bad at data. Like, you know, and, and economists aren't particularly good at it either, I think, um, on, for answering the kinds of questions that we really want to uh, get at. So we have sort of a casual empirical a uh, uh, world that we live in where uh, the sort of bad data that judges are drawing on and their intuitions that m- motivate their decisions and also bad data legislatures are drawing on. So we don't really um, have a correct solution, and, but that's going to be generally be true about um, ownership. The ownership is not fixed in the way that people believe it is. Ownership is constantly evolving. It's constantly up for grabs. And it was only in 2018 that the FAA said we're not going to regulate um, airplane seats. So airplanes keep squeezing them closer together. The reason that wedge of space, which is where we started, is so valuable is because airplanes have reduced that pitch from 35 inches down to 28 inches. So that wedge of space is really the breathing room for both the person in front and back. But it's not fixed in, you know, in stone uh, that the FAA won't regulate airplane seats. Like if this becomes too much of a problem, there's too many fist fights in airplanes, uh, too many health, or too many um, people getting injured by the sort of squish the uh, government can step in and, and change the ownership rule there. And that's true uh, both from courts and from legislatures. You have an interplay between them, a constant, a sort of ongoing battle over who owns what. So last question. Um, look, America is known as a litigious place and uh, lawyers have always had a central role in American society and, you know, goes back to de Tocqueville. Uh, you know, he, he pointed it out. And, um, and yet, um, you know, law is, is a discipline that's really restricted to a very small number of people, right? I mean, you know, there's very few undergraduate law uh, programs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's, there's really a, uh, elite group of, um, experts that kind of dominate the, the legal conversation. Uh, and yet I like to say that, um, if you're a business person, uh, uh, if familiarity with the law is as essential as, uh, familiarity of physics is with, if you're an architect, right, you know, you need to right. understand uh, the rules that, that, and the tools available to you. Um, and similarly in economics, if you look at law and economics, right? I mean, pretty much every lawyer now uh, knows something about economics, sure. but, 
But economists just kind of look at the law as a, as a, as a black box, right? They, they're very, um, they, they, they don't really understand the process by which law is, is produced and uh, disseminated and enforced. Um, what can we do to kind of um, instill a, a better understanding of, of the law in, in people who are not, not lawyers? Well, one step is to buy a book called Mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, we had, that was actually substantially why we wrote the book. It wasn't written for lawyers. I mean, it's, it's, it's also, I think, um, um, I have tremendous response among law audiences. I'm actually giving a talk in a few days to another law audience. Uh, but um, the real audience is people who want to sort of feel smarter about how law works. And a lot of economists sort of treat law as, a, as just a black box. You know, it's that they don't sort of ever get into like how the institutional mechanisms are that really uh, solve this resource conflict. Um, and it feels too complicated. Um, and part of the message of mine of the book is that it really isn't, that there's turns out to be this very small number of stories. They're quite tractable. Uh, they're people who are very skilled at using them and they're often not lawyers. Actually, my co-author uh, Jim and I have a recent article in um, Harvard Business Review that talks about the sort of cutting edge of business around ownership technology and ownership engineering. Like, how is it that Tesla profits from not using patents? How is it that um, HBO profits uh, by tolerating theft of mm -hmm. its passwords? Why is HBO, as a strategy, as a business strategy, actually let people take steal their passwords? So it turns out that there's really cutting edge businesses like HBO, um, like Tesla, like um, like Disney, like IBM, that are really with a lot of how they make their profits turn on ownership engineering, and it's not something that lawyers learn in law school. Uh, you know, they don't teach it to you in law school. The way you learn that is by being a sort of sophisticated ownership engineer and you get there sort of through the kind of practical experience, uh, partly from reading our book, but also from, you know, uh, fi figuring out how is it that we're going to basically build uh, HBO's audience. And what HBO figured out is having people steal their passwords was a good way to build their audience. Yeah, I love this idea of ownership engineering and ownership design. Uh, I think it's a, it's a super valuable concept uh, and tend to steal it. And use your intellectual property. Uh, I'll give you attribution, but no compensation. So thank you, Michael. I really appreciate you uh, joining me today. Uh, don't forget, uh, the book is called Mine. Um, and also, don't forget this book. I mean, this book is just amazing. I was just going back and, and rereading it. And I, 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 it's, it's, there's, there's nothing um, dated about this book. It's really fantastic. It's called uh, The Gridlock Economy. Uh, Michael, hope to see you sometime soon out in the Bay Area. It's it's such a pleasure to be on your show again. This is great. This is Unsiloed, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 